If you would, please grab your Bible and open up to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 2 is where we'll be today. Also inside of your bulletin, there is a sermon insert, the white insert. You can take that out and follow along with the sermon and the scriptures as well as on the screen. So we've been looking at a sermon series, How to Enjoy the Rest of Your Life. And this comes from the book of Philippians. Paul wrote this particular book, this letter, to a group of Christians encouraging them to rejoice and to rejoice in the Lord in spite of their circumstances. And the only way for us to be joyful in life, joyful in all that happens, is to rejoice in the Lord and not necessarily in our circumstances. And with that, I remind you that joy and happiness, they are different, very different. Happiness depends on our happenings. It depends on our circumstances. Happiness is external. However, joy from God is internal. Joy is a deep down confidence that no matter what is happening in life, we are trusting God that he is working things for our good and for his glory. Happiness depends on our circumstances controlling us, while joy it depends on God controlling us. Happiness is temporary while godly joy is permanent. So therefore, our ability to enjoy life is related, directly related to our willingness to trust God that He is in control of all of life, especially our lives. And our rejoicing is to be in God, not in our circumstances. So with that in mind, I've been encouraging you to memorize the first passage of Scripture in Philippians. Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4. And this is a little bit wordy, but I hope you've been working on memorizing it. And then in a few weeks, we'll go to a second memory verse out of Philippians. But say this one with me, Philippians 2, 3 and 4. Let's say it together. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interest of others. Philippians 2, 3, and 4. You're doing a good job with that. I heard more ladies' voices than I heard men's voices. So you men got to step it up next week. So far in this particular sermon series, we've looked at how to enjoy the people in our life. We've looked at how to be joyful during persecution. We have also looked at how to uh, enjoy life during times of conflict and how to reduce that conflict in our life. Today we come to part four, which is how to be like Jesus. So we're getting away a little bit from the idea of relationships and now more interpersonal relationship with Jesus and how we can be more like him. From Philippians chapter 2 today, I want to share with you four ways to become more like Jesus and then one benefit. Now, this is not an exhaustive list of all the ways we can become like Jesus, and it's certainly not a list of all the benefits. I'm just doing those that are presented in this particular scripture, Philippians 2 today. Being like Jesus, though, is certainly a goal that helps us to enjoy life. It's one of the purposes that God has left us here on earth for is to become more and more like Jesus. So it will help us to enjoy life. Now last week you may remember as we looked at the first part of Philippians 2, we were looking at several ideas for reducing conflict in our life. And we came to that idea of humility. Of course, being humble towards others and being humble towards God does reduce conflict. But we're gonna pick right up with that idea of humility as Paul emphasizes the humility of Jesus Christ himself. So starting in verse 5 is where we're going to start today. Look at number 1. Here's the first way that we can be like Jesus. To be like Jesus, I must change my attitude. So again, in verse 5, it says, You must have the same attitude that who? Christ Jesus had. Now, Paul could have said, You must have the same behavior that Christ Jesus had. Because in the, in the next few verses that we're going to look at in a moment, he talks about the behavior of Christ. But instead, he said you must have the same attitude. Why did he say attitude rather than behavior, if that's what he's going to talk about, is behavior? Well, it's an interesting concept that we find throughout the Bible, and that is our beliefs determine our behavior. 
Our thoughts, our attitudes, our beliefs, the way we're thinking eventually comes out in the way we speak and in our behavior. So Paul begins with an attitude. If my life is going to be more like Jesus, then the transformation has got to start up here in my head and what I think about and my attitude and my thoughts and my beliefs, and then it's going to come out in my behavior. The specific attitude Paul is talking about here as he points to Jesus is that attitude of humility. So all the ideas that we're looking at today come back to this characteristic of humility. However, to be like Jesus in humility or in any other godly characteristic, it begins with the way we think. It begins with our attitude. If you did not know it, <laughs> I'm sure you do, the 2024 presidential campaign is well underway. You have seen that, I'm sure, on the news or heard it on the radio. One of the consistent criticisms that gets thrown out during any political campaign, whether it be presidential or something else, is the idea of, or the criticism of flip-flop. And you've heard that before. Some, uh, someone in the news media will approach a candidate and say something like, two years ago, you said ABC, but now you're saying XYZ. Why have you flip-flopped? You've heard that before. It's a constant criticism against political candidates. But the truth of the matter is that we all change our attitude from time to time and from season to season. It doesn't matter what the topic is. It doesn't matter who the person is. It doesn't matter what's going on. We all have a tendency to somewhere in life change our attitude. And the reason we change our attitude and then what we say is because we've gained more maturity, we've gained more wisdom, we've gained more knowledge about it. And therefore we change our attitude and eventually what we say about it and how we behave. Years ago, my dad was getting ready to retire as a medical doctor and I decided to buy him a retirement gift. I bought him a computer. Aren't I a good son? <laughs> My dad in his medical clinic, you won't believe this, but this has been decades ago. He only had one or maybe two computers in the whole medical facility. And he never touched it. Only the ladies who were working for him doing secretarial work and doing all the billing, they were the ones who used the computer. Dad had never used a computer. So I bought him one now that he was retiring so he'd have something to do at home <laughs> to occupy his time. And my dad was a little bit concerned about that computer. He, in fact, he left it in the box for about a year. <laughs> never took it out, never used it. Now again, this was decades ago. So one day, one of my sisters, one of my older sisters, happened to be at the house she got the computer out of the box for the first time, set it up, and taught him how to use it. And of course, after that, he fell in love with it. He got very proficient on the computer and doing things over the internet and sending out email. Now, of course, he just uses, like you all, the cell phone, right? Everything is on the phone. He doesn't really need the computer. But it took a while for him to change his attitude and his thoughts about that computer. Spiritually speaking, the more we learn about Jesus... The more time we spend with Jesus, the more our attitude changes to be like that of Jesus. As we gain more information in life, as we gain more maturity in life, again, our attitude is going to change and eventually our behavior. So spiritually speaking, it's the same way. The more information we gain about Jesus through the word, the more spiritual maturity we have, the more we're going to be like Jesus. But if we choose to remain ignorant of the things of the world, then our attitude doesn't change, does it? We have to go through a process of learning and growing and maturing before our attitude changes. In the same way with Jesus Christ. If we ignore Jesus, then our attitude is not going to change that much. We have to spend time with him. We have to spend time in his word, praying to him, studying the word, studying who Jesus is, becoming more and more like him. But it begins up here. It begins in our attitude. So to be like Jesus, 
I've got to change my attitude to be like his attitude. Now look at the second idea that we have here. Number two, to be like Jesus, I must stop demanding. So this is a negative part of the scripture here. Look at verse six. Speaking of Jesus, he gives us this humble behavior. Remember, he's talking about humility, so now here's a humble behavior. Verse six, who though he was God, did not what? demand or cling to his rights as God. Now we learned several great theological truths about Jesus in this verse. First of all, Jesus is who? He is God. He was God from all ages past. John teaches us that. He was with God, he was one with God, but then at a certain point in time, God sent Jesus here to earth. And while here on earth, he was fully God and as well fully man. And now that he is back in heaven, Jesus is still fully God. And secondly, we learn here that in coming to earth, Paul teaches us that Jesus did not demand, he did not cling to his rights as God. So in becoming flesh and taking upon himself our flesh, Jesus did not deny his deity as God. He did not forfeit his deity as God. He did not forfeit or diminish equality with God. But instead, in humility, he never used his power or his authority to benefit himself here on the earth. He used his power and authority to benefit others. He healed others. He cast demons out. He was always serving other people. And we'll get to the idea of serving in a moment. But he didn't do it for himself. Instead, Jesus willingly suffered the worst possible humiliation rather than demanding his honor and his privilege and his glory. Rather than turn the stones into bread, Jesus fasted. Rather than call down 12 legions of angels to rescue him from the suffering, he suffered for you and me. He did not demand or cling to his rights as God. He demonstrated a behavior of humility so that you and I could have eternal life. Now, you and I cannot be like Jesus in a couple of ways. We cannot be like Jesus in the sense that he is God. We like to think of ourselves sometimes as God. Sometimes we pamper ourselves as gods. But the fact is we are not God and we are not gods. Also, we cannot be like Jesus in that he did not demand his rights as God. You and I are not God, and we certainly have no rights as God. But we can learn from this one verse, and we can imitate the humble behavior of Jesus by refusing to demand our rights at the expense of hurting other people. And I think that's the, a good way to apply this verse. I am not going to demand my rights at the expense of hurting other people. I have shared with you before that uh, my wife's dad, my father-in-law, was a certified public accountant in Birmingham. And he is retired now, but he had a small accounting firm, had several partners. One of his partners was Danny Brannon. And Danny was a smart man, smart accountant, helped the firm out a lot. And at his local bank, this was years ago, his local bank offered Danny if he would pay for it, something called, per, I gotta look at it real quick. Yeah, personal financial services. And it was in, uh, abbreviated PFS. And of course, this gave him a lot of services at the bank, a lot of privileges at the bank. And maybe at some time or another, you have bought something like that at your bank for extra privileges. Well, one day, Danny walked into the bank and there was a long line of people at the counter. So he's standing in line. You've done that before. You're standing in line at the bank. Danny was getting impatient. And he caught the eye of one of the bank tellers 
And he said, I deserve faster service. I have PMS and I demand faster service. Danny got confused between the abbreviation of PFS and PMS. Now, if there were a video of that, he would have won $10,000 on America's <laughs> Funniest Videos. <laughs> but he didn't. Jesus had the authority to demand his rights as God, but he chose not to. You and I have no real authority, do we? To demand anything, but we often do so anyway. And sadly, we demand authority even in the church, and we do so at the expense of hurting other people in the church. You may remember a passage also from Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul says, everything is permissible. Everything is permissible, but not everything is, do you know the next word? Beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Demanding our rights can often ruin relationships with other people. It can ruin our testimony of Jesus. So instead, we're to be humble like Jesus. How? By stop demanding our ways and our rights and our honor. Now look at a third idea. We move to a positive way of stating this. Number three, to be like Jesus, I must start serving. So this is the other side of the coin. Rather than demanding his rights, Jesus came to serve. Rather than demanding our rights at the expense of hurting others, we need to take the example of Jesus and serve in humility. So look at verse 7. We have here another humble behavior of Jesus. Paul says in verse 7, instead of this, what's he talking about? Demanding his rights. Instead of demanding his rights, instead of this, of his own free will, he gave up all he had and took the nature of a servant. He became like a human being and appeared in human likeness. So it's important to understand here what Jesus actually gave up in order to take upon himself human flesh and be a servant. As I've already stated, he did not give up being God. He was fully God and fully man on earth at the same time. However, Jesus did give up his outward expression of being God. In order for him to take on an outward expression of being a servant, of being flesh, he had to put aside that glorious, magnificent outward expression of being God. And so while here on earth, when people looked at Jesus, what did they see? A human being. They saw a man. They didn't see the glory of God, did they? So... Jesus set aside, he put aside his outward expression of being God while here on earth. And as I've already stated, he gave up his rights. He didn't cling to his rights as God. He also gave up his eternal riches. We learned in the book of 2 Corinthians that Jesus became poor in order that you and I might become rich. So he gave up his eternal riches. He gave up his uh, outward expression of being God. He also gave up that unique face-to-face -face relationship with God. He put all of that aside to take upon himself, as Paul says here, the nature of a servant. And he went as far, to as, far as to take upon himself our human flesh. But I want you to think about Jesus being a servant for a moment. As this passage teaches us, he became like a human being, he became the nature of a servant. As a servant, Jesus did not own anything. Jesus did not own a house. He didn't have any possessions that he owned. He traveled around quite a bit. He may have had the clothes on his back, but that was about it. Jesus did not own a business. He did not own a fishing boat, even though he was on several boats. Jesus didn't even have a horse or a donkey to ride. He had to borrow a donkey to ride into Jerusalem on what we now call Palm Sunday. Jesus had to borrow a room to celebrate the Passover with his disciples. He had nothing as a servant. 
It was the humility of Jesus that caused him to give up all those riches, all those possessions, in order to take upon himself our flesh and serve humanity. Jesus himself told us the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. You may remember, though, there was one particular occasion when Jesus was here on the earth where all of his glory reappeared. Jesus went up on a mountainside to pray one day, and he took Peter and James and John with him. Normally he went by himself, but he took three disciples with him. And while they were up on the mountainside praying, do you remember what happened? Jesus was transfigured. His clothes became white as lightning. His face became as bright as the sun. All of that glory suddenly reappeared. And even the disciples, Peter, James, and John, they heard what? They heard the voice of God. And Jesus was standing there with two other people, Moses and Elijah. It's like all of heaven came there for just a brief moment and all of his glory reappeared. But it wasn't long after that glorious moment that Jesus got on his knees in that upper room and washed his disciples' feet. Why? Because he, because he came to serve. He came in humility to serve. Last week, as we were talking about reducing conflict, I I mentioned to you that God has given us all spiritual gifts. And the purpose of these gifts is we are to use them to serve God and to serve each other. This is how the body of Christ is to function here on the earth. So rather than demand our rights, we're to take the gifts God has blessed us with and we're to serve God and we are to serve one another. This is how we can become more like Jesus. Now one more idea from Philippians here. Look at number four. To be like Jesus, I must obey God. So now we get to the very climax of the humble behavior. Jesus has not demanded his rights. He has come here to serve and also to be obedient to God. Look at verse 8 with me as Paul describes his behavior. And when he, when Jesus was living as a man, he humbled himself and was fully obedient to God. Even when that caused his death, Death on a cross. So the very reason that Jesus came to the earth in humility, setting aside all the glory of God that he had, was to die on a cross for you and me. To serve us by dying for us. By paying a penalty of punishment for sin that you and I could not possibly pay. And as Paul points out, Jesus was fully obedient to that. He was fully obedient to God the Father to die on a cross for us. And the cross being the worst possible death anyone could suffer at that particular time. So the scripture teaches us that Jesus gave of himself to be killed on the cross. He did that as an act of obedience to God the Father. His motivation was love for you and me. His attitude, humility. But his behavior was obedience. I want you to think about the whole of your life for a moment. If you think about all of your life, what has been to this point, what has been the most important task God has given you? Some of you might say, well, the most important task God has given me is to be married to the same spouse for 50 plus years. Some of you might say, well, no, the most important task God has given to me is to be in this particular job for 40 plus years. Some of you might say the most important task God has given me is to be a parent or to be a grandparent. Some of you might say the most important task God has given me is to have a certain ministry in the church or in the community. But whatever that task is, however you would answer that question, I would ask you a second question, and that is, have you been obedient to that task? The most important task Jesus had was to experience death on a cross. He was obedient to that, giving you and me eternal life. But have we been obedient to the most important task God has given us? To be like Jesus, we must be obedient. We must obey him. Now, look on the back of your notes. We're going to take a look at one benefit of being like Jesus, becoming like Jesus. There are many, but there's one here in this passage 
that I want to read to you. And it's simply this. The benefit of be, becoming like Jesus is that Jesus will be exalted and God will be glorified. Let's read it in the scripture, verses 9 through 11. Paul says, therefore, all that, all that he's talked about so far, therefore God elevated him, Jesus, to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So because of the humility of Jesus, because he didn't demand his rights, because he came to serve, because he was obedient unto death, what has God done? God has elevated Christ to the highest honor. No other person in the past or in the future will ever receive the highest honor that Jesus has already received. That's it. He has received the highest honor. Also, God has exalted him and given him a name above all names. So throughout history, past and future, no other person is going to have the best name except for Jesus. So he's been placed at the highest honor, given the name above all other names. And then Paul says, if that's not enough, every knee is going to bow in heaven, on earth, under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. So at a given point in time in the future, when all is said and done, every person that has ever lived or that will ever live is going to look at Jesus and realize the truth of who he is and what he did. But at that point, it will be too late to believe in him as Savior. The time to believe in Jesus as Savior is right now. Because what Paul is talking about here in the future is going to be the end. It will be too late to acknowledge him as Savior. You have to do that now before you die and before this happens. But at that point, every person will realize who Jesus Christ is and what he has done. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess that, yeah, he is the highest. He is the greatest. When a young boy grows up to be like his father, when a young boy grows up to talk like his father, when a young boy grows up to walk like his father, when a young boy grows up to take over the father's business, who gets the honor for all of that? The father. Isn't that weird? <laughs> That's what this verse is talking about. When you and I become more and more like Jesus, he gets the honor. It's not about us. It's all about God. It's all about Jesus. But our task and our responsibility is to become more like him each and every day. And the more we become like Jesus, the more he will be honored here on earth as well. So my invitation to you today is this. Choose to become like Jesus. Paul has given us some ideas of how to do that, some very practical ways of doing that. And I hope that you will be obedient to this scripture. You know, you and I have many different choices in life. We have, we're faced with many choices in life. But this choice to become like Jesus, the choice to believe in Him as Savior, the choice to accept Him as Lord and Savior, the choice to become like Him, that's the most important choice you will ever have in life. There's really no other choices that come close to that. We are to become like Jesus every day. So with that in mind, I challenge you, become more like Jesus. Let's pray about it. Father, thank you for teaching us how to become like Jesus. Thank you for your word and the way Paul has written it in Philippians 2. Thank you for this example of Jesus, of humility. And I pray here that everyone in this room today will choose to follow the example of Jesus and become like him. So help us, God, to be more like your son so that he will be exalted and you will be glorified. May our life of being like Jesus lead others to believe in Jesus as well. 
We pray for your help in doing this. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.